Welcome to Light Blood. This is George G. And the time is right. Welcome to today's guest, strong and powerful, Rich Kasparian. Rich, are you ready to do this? Absolutely. All right, let's go. Rich is the president of Garden City Financial Group. He's working passionately with individuals, families, and businesses to manage and help them pursue their financial goals. Rich, tell us a little bit about your personal life, some more about your work, and why you do what you do. Yeah, Rich Kasparian, um, that's who I am. I was uh, born and raised in the Bronx, New York, moved out to Long Island, uh, probably about 30 some odd years ago, married with three kids, um, worked um, um, and in 2009, when things were collapsing, so to speak, after the financial crisis, I was working with Smith Barney for many years, and I decided to go into my own practice, which I've done now for the last 12 years uh, successfully. And uh, the big basis of my business is not only, you know, trying to point clients in the right direction to uh, enhance their portfolios, but protect their portfolios, especially in down times. Yeah, I think uh, it certainly strikes me that when things are going great, it makes it a little easier and it's more fun to check our portfolios and our investments and all that. But when things get a little choppy or tumultuous, however you want to say it, that's when fear tends to grip us. And then our human brains, which are great, tend to lead us astray a lot of the time. That's correct. That's, that is right, the way it generally goes. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 there, there's not one size fits all, but I, I, I don't know the best way to sort of jump into it, but how, how do you help people protect against risk? Well, you know, the general theme in, in uh, my side of the business is, is diversification. That's what you hear, you know, nonstop from most financial advisors. Are you diversified? Are you diversified? Well, what does that really mean? Um, diversification in the simple terms to most people or most even financial advisors is how is your portfolio structured? Okay, so how much of what you own is equities or stocks and how much of what you own is fixed income or bonds or cash? Um, and they devise this sort of strategy whereby if a person is a certain age, uh, they'll determine what the percentages on each would be. Uh, so if they were relatively young, you know, they would have you know, maybe 70% in stocks or equities, but 30% in bonds and so on and so forth. So that is sort of the age base, one size fits all in the business. Um, I sort of take a very different approach because there's, there, there are times when bonds could be down and stocks could be down or bonds could be up. And stocks could be up. Um, we, we don't, even though typically they work inversely, they don't always. The market has been its own species for about the last 15 years. Um, we've had times where we saw commodities, bonds, and stocks go up in parity. Um, so what I typically do is there are programs out there that are built whereby you can have upside in the market, but have downside protections. Uh, meaning some sort of a barrier or a buffer. Um, now, the old argument in this theory was that if you did that, you were sacrificing so much upside. So in other words, if I wanted to protect my, my assets in the old days, you were sacrificing this huge amount of upside, so it wasn't worth it. Well, those days have changed, and they've sort of progressed over the last 15, 20 years. So there, there are programs, um, you know, that allow you to capture the upside of indexes like the S&P 500, um, the Russell 2000, the NASDAQ 100, the Dow Jones. And there are programs out there that are called structured notes. These are bonds that are built to capture indexes on the upside, but they give you a very big downside protection. So if that matured and those indexes did not perform, you have a large downside protection, which means the house has to put the money back in to the bond or the account to make you whole or somewhat whole. 
There are other programs that are available through many insurance companies, annuity-based programs, where they'll provide you an income, some cases an income for life, or they'll provide you downside protection if you have one of their growth programs. So that's how it's really done. And, and in a lot of these programs, you could still select, hey, how, many, how much do I want in bonds and how much do I want in stocks? But it is a actual true downside protection. Got it. So when you're talking to clients, potential clients about indexes, how much of that is grasp and how much goes over, go, goes over people's heads? Well, that's a great question because back in, you know, years ago, and then, you know, I'll see even say 15 years ago, you, you know, person would come in and did you see the Dow today? You know, it was all about the Dow hmm. and the comical part of the Dow is it's 30 stocks. So 30 stocks have driven our brain for, you know, 100 plus years, you right. know, and, and that sort of, that has changed because you, you do hear people speaking much more about the S&P 500, which are 500 large U.S. companies, Russell 2000, which are your smaller 2000, you know, stocks. Um, so it has, it has somewhat changed beyond the old story of uh, the Dow and the NASDAQ. Um, so they, they they definitely understand it more. Uh, and a lot of even mutual funds or a lot of investments now are tied more to indexes. You know, you see a lot more of that now where the, where the investors understand it. Got it. Nice. That makes sense. Fascinating, right? The Dow Look, stock markets yeah. crashing, the stock markets way up. Well, kind of, <laughs> yeah, no, ex exactly. You know, the S and P I would argue is probably a bigger indicator but they generally trade in parity. The, 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 the Russell is sort of a different animal because what typically happens when you have smaller stocks or smaller companies in a recovering economy, they usually lead the way. But, but you know, like currently right now, let's say the Dow right now is about 8% 8, 8 off the high, give or take. Um, the S&P maybe right now is about six or seven off its high. The, the Russell is probably down since November, like 16% off its high. So a lot of the times what you'll see is the Russell could be like an indicator of what's coming, whether it be, you know, potentially be up or down. You will see that a lot. Interesting. So you're talking about how it used to be that uh, I wrote down the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. So you wanted to participate in upside, you wanted down downside protection, but I'm guessing that it sounds like the cost was too high. And it strikes me that any time that we're trying to make decisions about if it, the kind of investment or the investment vehicle or product or whatever it is, we just we need to make an educated and informed decision about this is the cost, the fees, the, the, the whatever expenses are part of this program that I'm looking at and this is what it gets me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that is, that is the absolute case. Um, you have to sort of weigh everything out. Um, you know, in many, in many of the programs, you know, there are, there are costs associated with protection. Some of them, no, some of them is, it is built into the, the program. Um, but, the, the, the case of that is, you know, and I've always said this to people, if they say, well, geez, this program is a higher fee than, say, a mutual fund. Um, and I would say, yes, it is. But the risk is if you drive the car down the street without insurance, would you do it? And most people say, no, if they have an accident, I can't have insurance. Plus, I'm not allowed to. Um, it's the same. So, so why wouldn't people have sort of insurance or some sort of protection? for their investments, even, even if it means a, a cost. Um, now, when we evaluate portfolios, we don't charge anything. That's all part of our business at Garden City Financial Group. Um, so evaluating portfolios, doing an analysis, that's all included. What I will say coming back to diversification and what we see a lot of when we're managing or, or not managing, reviewing people's portfolios is what you'll see is they say, I'm diversified. But forgetting the protection for a second, I'm a, I'm, I have a diversified portfolio. And then when you start to look at their statements and see how they were set up, 
say, oh, I'm diversified. I own 10 mutual funds in my 401k retirement plan. Well, the problem is, is that a lot of funds have different names or nice little fancy names. So it's, uh, it's a large cap fund or a growth fund. And then when you drill down, the amazing part of it is many of them all own the same stocks. So I had a client a few years back, I'm diversified. And we literally took a highlighter. We did a printout of all of the funds and we literally took a highlight highlighter. And what we found was all of them own Microsoft, all of them own Amazon, all of them own Facebook. So when you, when you really broke it down, you, you saw that, you know, they have different names, a lot of these funds. And unless you really drill down, you wouldn't even know it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty wild how, how that is the case. And I think that most people would be really surprised by that because yep. there's all these different, to your point, all these different names and packaging for products that probably end up being fairly similar, but we don't know until we know. And the only way we know is if we actually look and, and right. dig into everything. I think that that's, that's one of the problems with, with the financial services, the world of personal finance is just, just so many terms and so much jargon and so much sort of unnecessary complexity. And I think you've done a great job sort of breaking down the misnomers when it comes to diversification when you're talking to people about risk and risk tolerance, that that's also one of those sort of black boxes. It's like, okay, I know that I'm supposed to have a risk tolerance, but what does that really mean? And how do I figure out what my real risk tolerance is? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's a great question. The, I, I look at it sort of as two, two directions. A lot of advisors, what they will do is they will sort of give you this little questionnaire Mm -hmm. and you know try to determine your 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 feelings on it and and they're available out there i look at it more from emotion because that's really what risk tolerance is so if you know i and i've said to new prospects or customers or or you know, potential customers if that statement comes in the mail and the market is down do you open the envelope do you slowly open the envelope? <laughs> do you tear it in half or do you bury it until you think the market is up? That predicates, as crazy as this myth sound and so juvenile, but it really does predicate the person's risk tolerance and, and what they can handle. If they can't open that envelope or every time they turn their computer on and see where their portfolios are, they're in a panic. Then, then you have to say as a financial advisor is, you know, how does, what, what is the way, what is their risk tolerance? Is it moderate? Is it totally conservative? The other thing I do that I think is very different and we do as a whole, as a firm is we work backwards. So many advisors, if a customer came in and said, I have X amount of dollars to invest, Unfortunately, there are a lot of advisors. Let, let's say the number was $50,000. I'm just throwing out a number. An advisor would come in and, and, and determine how much liquidity they have, but would say, okay, you have 50, let's invest 50,000. What, what we do is we work backwards. So I'll say to a person, okay, this is what you have liquid. How much of that do you want to invest? Do you have money for a rainy day? Because the goal is in investing is you want to sort of lock it up. You want to tuck it away. You want to make sure it's there. And then we could make sure we have protections on the money. But if there's not enough money in the bank, then you're kidding yourself. Because what happens is then when the customer needs money, they have to dip into that investment. If the market's down, they might, they could potentially be losing money at that point. So those are two of the ways we sort of work with risk tolerance. Number one, what's your cash position first? And then number two, what's your emotion tied? How closely tied are you to your portfolio emotion wise? And what, you know, what can you handle when we're trying to set up a portfolio? I think that that's a great approach. Certainly one of the least exciting areas of maybe anything is just making sure you have enough cash set aside. Right. And that's right. I'm sure you get questions all the time. Isn't there an opportunity cost to, to, to just not having that invested? 
Right. Well, and I'm sure yeah, that I mean, you, yeah, you, 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 you know, like I'll say to people, well, but I'm not making any money in the bank. You're not. And it's terrible for, but it's there. And that's just sort of the cost of doing business. You, you <laughs> want to make sure that the goal is not to have to dip into your long-term or even midterm investments and, and having enough for that day where if you need the extra cash, it's there. Yeah. Going back to your car insurance analogy and the price that you're paying for needing money and not having the value of your emergency fund have gone down by 40% because the market went down by 40% that's the premium that you're paying for your car insurance. It's just missing out on a little bit of opportunity cost. So that's right. Yep. I like it. Uh, I, I love your analogy about how you respond when the market's down. What do you do when you, when, when the statement comes <laughs> in the mail? I think that that's, yeah. you just need to be really, really, really honest with ourselves. No, you do. And, and just you know, coming back to the liquidity, the, the people will often say to me, well, that's a hard question. How much liquidity do I need? I'm not sure. You know, and, and there's a lot of formulas out there, six months of bills. But for a lot of the, you know, accredited type investors we're dealing with, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they're not living check to check, so to speak. Um, so in that realm, the number is different. Um, I, it was a funny, quick story. Some years ago, we, we, I had a customer who kept an enormous amount of money in liquidity, literally making zero. He was purchasing treasury treasury bills, which were practically zero. I mean, the joke was the government, you're paying the government to keep your money versus the other way. And it was the, the funny joke was it was $4 million. And every month it would come and he would just say, roll it over, roll it over, roll it over. And we buy 30 day treasury bills at basically a 0% interest rate. Um, and the joke was, you, you know, at some point, I said, are you going to buy a big house in the Hamptons next month? What, what do you do? You know, and he would laugh and he would say, roll it over. So his threshold, his liquidity number in the bank was 4 million. And like I said, for everybody, it's a different number. You know, it, it could be 50,000. It could be in his case, 4 million. It depends on the investor. Yeah, I like it. You know, in a perfect world, there'd be perfect ideal situations, but we don't live in a perfect world and uh, we need to be able to sleep at night and not develop horrible ulcers. So yep. just figuring out what's right for you is such a key thing. Well, Rich, the people are ready for that difference making tip. What do you have for them? I think the different difference making tip is you, when you look at your portfolio, um, you have to say to yourself, let's say you were nearing retirement and you have to say to yourself, where is my portfolio at? And if I were to retire, you know, next week, what would happen if the market had a major downturn? Uh, we saw this in 01, we, we actually 2000, and we saw this in 08 again, um, you know, where if that person was going to retire or nearing retirement, that money they thought they had basically eroded. And they weren't like the 45 or 50 year old that had time to say, hey, the market will come back. Don't worry about it. So, you know, that's sort of where we come in and we can look at protections and we can look at ways to evaluate those portfolios and say, OK, this is what we can do to sort of put an umbrella around the investments. So that what I you know, that's what I think we can do. Our, our website, by the way, is www.gardencityfinancialgroup.com. There's a lot of good information. There's videos. We have a blog. And of course, you know, anyone can contact us if they have any further questions. Well, I think that is great stuff that definitely gets it. Come on. Rich, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate thank it. You. Give us the website again. www.gardencityfinancialgroup.com. Perfect. Well, if you enjoyed this much as I did, show Rich your appreciation and share today's show with a friend who also appreciates good ideas, go to GardenCityFinancialGroup.com and check out the great resources and get in touch with Rich. Thanks again, Rich. Thank you, George. It's great to be with you. And until next time, keep fighting the good fight as we are all in this together. <laughs>